From the EPR Creation Studio, this is Jason Staples bringing you Unconquered with Doc Staples. This podcast, as always, is brought to you by EPR Creations, by Luis Marquez of Keller Williams Realty in Jacksonville, Florida, by Shenandoah Real Estate in the Research Triangle of North Carolina, by Garage Makeovers, the number one garage remodeling company in South Florida, and by my newest advertising partner, Justin Galloway of Benchmark Mortgage. As always, information's in the show notes. Let them know you heard about them from the Unconquered podcast with Doc Staples. All right, it's that time of year where rivalry is here. Once again, Florida State playing Florida this weekend. Recording this early since uh, Thanksgiving holiday is on the way, or actually here by the time this uh, this is released. But... More intriguing than it would have been a couple weeks ago, unfortunately. And yeah, a lot to to work through in this one. So I'm going to go ahead as usual and start on the Florida State defense against the Florida offense side of things. And quite frankly, this is the the scarier matchup for Florida State. It's a good Florida offense in, in a lot of respects. And they're going to be a bit unpredictable because of the injury to Graham Mertz. Mertz, of course, broke his collarbone last week in the Missouri game, replaced by redshirt freshman Max Brown, who actually played pretty well in his uh, in his stead. Brown, 6'2", 220. Pretty good arm, like the way the ball came off his hand, uh, through with decent accuracy, uh, was uh, looking at the numbers here was uh, four of five for 56 yards in that game and had several uh, several big runs in that game, seven runs for 42 yards, really good athlete. Uh, not, a, not a twitchy guy, not, not super explosive, and not, not a huge guy, again, about 220 pounds. But a guy that's fast enough, I mean, he's you know probably 4'6 area and a willing runner and a guy that they will involve in the, run, in the running game. Not, I don't expect to see, to have him be, you know, Graham Mertz. Mertz has had a pretty good year, actually. Uh, you know, you look at Mertz's numbers, and you know there was some some giggling when Florida took him at the beginning of the year as a as a transfer, and it turns out, you know, they they evaluated pretty well. I mean, Mertz on the season, seventy two point nine completion percentage, eight point one yards per attempt, twenty touchdowns, three picks. Those are outstanding numbers. I mean, that's that's a good year. Now, the Florida team has not been good around him, but all told, I mean, that's been an efficient offense and that's been an efficient passing game. I mean, just looking at the overall passer rating here, Mertz finished the season uh, at present coming into this week, 19th in the country in passer rating. I mean, that's pretty good. Jalen uh, Jordan Travis is... Uh, 25th, Mertz 157, Jordan Travis 154. Now, Travis obviously brought some other things to the table that Mertz didn't, but that just gives you an indication. This Florida Florida offense has been pretty good on the season, and it really was a balanced offense. I mean, Mertz was able to do quite a bit in the passing game, and then their run game, which we'll talk about in a moment, was excellent. Now, the passing game, not really a heavy downfield team. I mean, average depth of target on the season for Mertz, 6.7 yards. That's, uh, that's not, not real high. I mean, that's just a a little bit ahead of, or a little bit behind Cade Klubnick at seven, Bo Nix at seven. These are guys that throw the ball behind the line of scrimmage quite a bit. And, you know, when they do throw, they're not throwing down the field a bunch, a lot of crossing routes, a lot of, um, a lot of deep crosses, a lot of shallows, screen passes, various things. They did a lot of things to make it easy for him. For perspective, Jordan Travis was 28th in the country in average depth of target, 9.9 yards per uh, per per pass in terms of uh, average average depth of target. So that's that's uh, much closer to to the top end of that. Throwing it throwing it downfield a lot. So. Yeah, that's been the Florida offense. They dink and dunk you in the passing game. And then every so often they'll, they'll, you know, hit normally 
crossing routes for for their bigger plays, uh, not really pushing the ball down the field a bunch. Now, interesting question is whether with Max Brown, they end up doing that a bit more. Uh, he does seem to have a, a decent arm. I would expect not. I think you're still going to see them run basically the same possession passing offense. And, and essentially, they're trying to find a lot of easy ways for the quarterback to get easy completions and you know not have to not not be in position to turn it over because what they're wanting to do is use that as a that that possession passing game as a supplement to really what the what the offense is built around and that is the the running game and specifically Trevor Etienne and Montrell Johnson uh the the two backs those guys are both outstanding and Incidentally, they have the same number of yards on the season, ETN and Montrell Johnson, each with 710 yards on the season. That's um, that's pretty good. I mean, that's excellent. So you look at uh, at Florida State rushing, Trey Benson at 743, Lawrence Toafili next at 322. Florida has two guys with just under the same number of uh, of yards as Trey Benson, and both guys also very efficient. Trevor uh, Trevor Etienne averaging 5.8 yards a carry, or almost 5.9, and Montrell Johnson 5.3. They've been efficient, and they are explosive. So that's the, that's the real concern. They've got a very good, very big offensive line, and then they've got backs who are breakaway threats, particularly Etienne. Etienne a lot like his brother, not quite as fast as his brother, but a a real big play threat and a guy that that. Is is bursty through the line of scrimmage and a th- and a threat in the in the passing game. Both guys, uh, good pass catchers, and you know something you you have to worry about with them in terms of how Florida uses them. They'll show a lot of eye candy, do a lot of different things, and then get the uh, get the backs the ball in space. So that's what they do. They're going to feed those backs. So just thinking in terms of how many carries, Montrell Johnson 134, Etn 121. I mean, Trey Benson has 119. So, you know, Florida Florida State has run run the football 362 times on the season, including kneel downs, including sacks. So 362 of those, Florida, 377. They, they run it even more than Florida State does. And they lean on that heavily. And when they're not leaning on that again, it's a lot of that possession passing game, a lot of a lot of rub routes, a lot of uh, short stuff that they're just trying to dink and dunk and give easy completions to the quarterback because they're very much a success rate, keep the, keep ahead of the chains, win with leverage kind of offense. That's what they do. They want to pound the ball, win with leverage, win with consistency, and they don't have a ton of uh, big play stuff happening in the passing game generally. The, it, when, when it does happen, it's almost always through Pearsall. Uh, and Florida State fans already know who he is because he had a pretty darn good game against Florida State last year. Ricky Pearsall, uh, by a pretty good sight, almost twice as many yards as the next next guy on this on this roster in terms of receiving. Uh, Eugene Wilson, the freshman, has the second most receiving yards on this team. But Pearsall is about to go over a thousand. So you know, and he's he is a uh, he's got some burst. He's got some some uh, some good long speed, tough cover. Six one one ninety, pretty you know, pretty versatile and well rounded wide receiver, and a guy that that you do have to know where he is because of how they're how they feed the ball to him. I mean, he's he he gets the ball a lot, and he's the one guy that that will do a lot of things downfield. Their next best guy, Eugene Wilson, five ten, more of a, a speed guy, and uh, and and again, not as much of a true big play threat in the way that he that that he uh, is used. Not a ton of vertical routes from them, and, and and like I said, when they are hitting big big plays, it's usually on you know deep crossers and and some uh, sometimes they'll hit you with a like a post wheel type combo that sort of thing. But this there's not a whole lot of just line up and let that guy go, go vertical and hit it in the seam or or hit it over the top or back shoulder type stuff. They're not doing a ton of that. Uh, this is a run the football, RPO play action off the run and. You know, a lot of a lot of action going horizontally in the pass game. To me, looking at this game, it really boils down to uh, Florida. I think Florida State has the edge in terms of pass defense against that against a freshman quarterback. 
against Max Brown, but the the real place where where the rubber hits the road is going to be in the run game. This is a Florida team that I expect to be able to have some success against Florida State in the run game. Similar in a lot of ways to what uh, what Miami does, and the difference is that I think Florida. I, I said going into the Miami game, I think Miami's running backs are, are by and large pretty average. I think Florida has two guys that are you know legitimate NFL NFL prospects at running back and are above average backs. So basically, imagine Miami, but with but with good you know, upper tier running backs instead of average to, you know, a little above average. These are really good backs. And if you give them a seam, if you give them space, they're going to take it and they're going to, they're going to make your life miserable and they can run and hide. They're guys that can make big plays out of things, particularly, like I said, ETN, he's a guy that has had uh, some, some long runs and some long plays on the season. So to me, this is one of those games where knowing what Florida has, at wide receiver, knowing that you're that they're bringing in a a true freshman or a redshirt freshman that is who has, you know, in terms of of total experience, he has twelve total passes in his in his career. This is this is a game where I think you you really double down on stopping the run, you get aggressive, and you let your your defensive backs play a lot of one on one coverage and try to take that run away, take away the big plays in the running game with your safeties, do everything possible to choke them out and force them to have to beat you over the top. And I think that's what Florida State's going to do in this game. You bring those safety blitzes, you bring those field pressures, you bring some of the, you know, the boundary corner off the edge in in different situations and try to put pressure on that running game. Get penetration. They've got some some injuries, uh, particularly left tackle Austin Barber is still questionable, and even if he plays, probably not fully fully healthy. Uh, I think you've got to take advantage of some of that weakness up front. You've got to take advantage of the absence of major playmakers outside. I think you have the corners. Again, Pearsall's a good player, and he's going to get his a little bit, but I think you have the corners and, and overall coverage on the back end to say, Look, come into this game and force Max Brown and those wide receivers to beat you down the field. And if they beat you doing that, then you tip your cap. But what you are not going to do is let ETN and uh, that running game, you know, ETN and Montrell Johnson beat you on the ground. That's the thing you can't let happen. You've got to get those guys off the field. You've got to get some tackles for loss. You've got to deal with, you, you add that extra fit in the running game and make sure that those guys don't get free. That's what you've got to do to win this game on that side of the ball. And I think that's what Florida State's going to do. On the year, they've been averaging 4.38 yards per carry. That's a little bit skewed because it was 0.62 in that game one against Utah. You know, not very good in that in the early going. 2.38 against, against uh, Kentucky. But then you get to the last four games, and they averaged 4.36 yards per carry against Georgia, four against Arkansas, 4.31 against LSU, and 6.53 yards per carry against Missouri. So the last month, the last four games, they've averaged over four yards a carry against Georgia, Arkansas, LSU, and Missouri with a pretty big breakout, 261 rushing yards against Missouri. So it's a team that's been able to find themselves a little bit in the running game over the past month. And they're, they're in position to be able to make things a little bit more difficult for Florida state on that front. That's what you've got to stop. That's what you've got to deal with. If you can limit them to, you know, under four yards per carry, you win the game. If you limit them to 4.5 or, or, or fewer yards per carry, probably do. You're probably in position to win the game. But you're gonna have to you're gonna have to do that. You're gonna have to focus on winning up front. This is a game where uh, Farmer, Lovett, Fisk, Verse, those guys are are critical players against the run to be able to take away what Florida is gonna have to do to beat you. For Florida, they they're gonna have to be able to run the football to beat this Florida State team. They have to. You're not gonna be able to beat this Florida State team through the air. I don't think with with Max Brown throwing to Pearsall and that group of receivers. 
So you just make it, you make them do that. And I think you come out in, in good shape. I think you come out basically given up, you know, look at their, at their averages here. They average 5.75 yards per play against Florida, 5.63 against Arkansas, 6.15 against LSU and 7.58 against Missouri. I think you can give up at something with a five, you know, kind of comparable to Georgia and Arkansas. 5.31 at Kentucky, 5.21 against against Tennessee. I mean, I think you can give up, you know, 5.5 and, and feel like that's a pretty good day. And again, you're taking away some big plays in the process. To me, that's success in this game. Now, moving on to the other side of the ball, this is where I think FSU has has a significant advantage, even with the quarterback situation without Jordan Travis. Florida's defense has not been very good. And specifically, most importantly, Florida's giving up over five yards a carry on the season. So let's go down the list. They gave up 9.14 yards per carry against Kentucky. They gave up four and a half against Georgia, 4.81 against Arkansas, 9.4 yards per carry to LSU. You know, most of that was Jaden Daniels running wild from the quarterback spot, which would have been really, you know, really good for a for a guy like Jordan Travis to be able to potentially replicate that if they wound up needing it. And 5.53 yards per carry against Missouri. This is a game where Florida State is going to come in needing to feeling like they need to establish the run with a with a backup quarterback, with a less experienced quarterback. It's a game where given how Florida has played against the run, this sets up to be a pretty enormous game for Florida State's running game. You feel like Florida State should be able to run the football and have some big plays in this game. You know, Trey Benson, if he's healthy, you know, healthy enough to to do it. You look at Trey Benson, this is a game that sets up really well for him to have some some really big plays cuz they they're a team that gives up a ton of big plays in the running game. A ton. You get you get past the second level, you get past that first level and they're pretty big. They got some big dudes on that defensive line, but they're a little undisciplined with their fits. You know, you see those those backers are a little bit of youth and their eyes aren't always the most disciplined. They you know, don't always fit well. And as soon as you get to that level, there's some missed tackles, guys aren't always in the right in the right spot, and you know, that secondary doesn't really show a whole lot of indication of being able to fill and tackle and and chase you and, and tackle in the open field. You get Benson, you get Toafili, you know, any of FSU's backs in the open field, and they should be able to cook. That's this game. You feel like you should be able to to run for over five yards a carry on this team, and with a few big runs, I mean, again, you get you get Trey Benson in the open field against this team, and he's got a chance to take it every time. I mean, they're not real fast at safety. I think this this secondary is a little bit soft and a little bit slow. So, and the the linebackers that they've got a little bit on the slower side, got some good size, but they come downhill hard and not always into the right gaps. So if you use some formation, some motion, some different things, you can get what you want. You get that, that seam for a guy like Benson. And I think he can have a huge day provided again, he's, he's healthy. I mean, we all saw uh, him, you know, sort of not, not looking like he felt the best against North Alabama, but again, I think he'll, he'll be fine for this one. So you feel like you should be able to run the football well on this team. And secondary wise, they've also not been super terrific. You know, again, LSU averaged 14.3 yards per attempt, Missouri 9.5 yards per attempt. And this is not a team with a bunch of interceptions. They've got three on the season. So they've not, not turned teams over a bunch, which is why their overall turnover margin is minus four. They've only gained seven total uh, turnovers on the season, three INTs and four, 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 or four recovered fumbles. And that, again, that's the real question in this game. Can Florida State throw the football and, and have a balanced offense without turning it over? Well, the good thing is that Florida hasn't turned a whole lot of teams over this year. 
There are three INTs, one against uh, South Carolina, one against Tennessee, one against Arkansas. Everybody else has played interception free against against Florida. And everybody else has been able to have, you know, has been able to generate quite a bit of yardage against this Florida secondary. To me, this is a Florida defense that Florida State should be able to have its way with. Jordan Travis or not. And of course, not going to have him. So, you know, this is a this is a matchup where I think looking at the total offense numbers here, Florida's given up 6.67 yards per play on the season. LSU averaged 11.49 yards per play and putting up 701 yards. And of course, Florida State's not going to do that. But you watch that Missouri game, Florida State could do what Missouri did in terms of the, the, the players that Missouri puts out there and what they brought to the table in that game. You know, you feel like Tate Rodemaker with the weapons that Florida State has around him and with the line that they've got is pretty comparable to what Missouri brought to the table. Missouri averaged 7.58 yards per play. Could have put up a, quite a few points in there, but stalled in the red zone a couple times, had to settle for field goals. That, that's why that game was close. And actually, that, that red zone question is a legitimate issue. That's a legitimate concern. You know, I mentioned on the last podcast that uh, in the absence of Jordan Travis, the biggest thing, the, your biggest concern is that Travis doesn't throw, tur- doesn't throw uh, interceptions, doesn't turn the ball over. And, you know, will his replacement be as consistent and reliable in that regard? And, you know, Rodemaker in the past has, you know, in practice and and in early appearances, whether spring game or otherwise, has turned the ball over some. So that's your biggest concern. The other thing that, you know, I didn't mention is in the red zone, when things get really tight, Jordan Travis's combination of outstanding feel, you know, he under, he, he and, and ball handling in terms of, read option, you know, a variety of different things that he he can do in terms of the uh the the ball handling stuff and his ability to read and and make the late pull and then use his athleticism that's a huge advantage in ter- in the red zone in terms of turning red zone visits into touchdowns. I with that with Tate Rodemaker, I don't think you have that. Rodemaker is going to have to make the throws for them to be as prolific in the red zone as they need to be. And that's something that's a real concern in this game. Is Florida going to be able to to sort of play roulette and wind up, you know, red zone roulette and wind up getting a couple stops and keeping this game close? Because Florida's offense is good. Even with the backup, a little bit, little bit scary. But I think Florida State's defense will be able to handle most of what they're de- dealing with. The real question is, Without Jordan Travis, how much will that impact Florida State in terms of turnovers and red zone production in this game? Because Travis doesn't run a bunch, but he had quite a few little pulls for scores in the red zone. You know, you look at uh, look at his numbers on the year and seven touchdowns, most of which are for from in close. So the question is, you know, will Rodemaker be able to? to replicate anything like that or, you know, Brock Glenn or whoever, whoever's playing at quarterback in, in Travis place, will, the, will, will they be able to match what Travis was able to do in the red zone in terms of efficiency? And it's going to be a lot harder because he had some advantages that they didn't or that they don't. So I look at this in all honesty, I see a game where Florida state should have a significant advantage in terms of playmakers, in terms of overall defense, being a more complete team. I do see a a Florida team that's scary because of some of the playmakers that they do have, especially at running back and against a team that's given up some rushing yards. You know, Florida State, in terms of what their defense has been willing to give up this year, they've given up more on the ground than through the year. And, you know, Florida is very much through the ground instead of the year as they're offensive strength. So again, the thing that you're expecting if you're Florida State, or the thing that I would expect if I'm Florida, if I'm Florida's offensive coordinator, 
is I would expect Florida State's defensive front and just defense in general to put to apply as much pressure as possible and force Florida to beat them with anything other than the running game. You get hits on the quarterback, force them to to throw the football and rely on your secondary to make plays. I think they'll be able to do that. I think they'll be able to limit Florida. They'll give up a couple big plays, but you'll trade the big plays for the ability to keep them from shortening the game and running a bunch of uh running a bunch of running it down your throat basically. And I think Florida State will be able to do that for the most part. I think on the other side as I mentioned, it's really about turnovers. Can they stay balanced? But I think they'll be able to run the football. I think they'll be able to throw it on play action and in in the RPO game. You know, they they do a lot of spot drop uh zone and I think there's going to be a lot of holes there. In a lot of ways, Florida's defense is the kind of matchup that you'd want to see in the first start for a guy like Tate Rodemaker. It's a defense that doesn't get a ton of pressure. It's a defense that spot drops in, in terms of its zones quite a bit. And there's usually some space, you know, between the hashes, between the numbers, you've got some seams, you can hit, hit your targets and they don't have anybody that really presents as a lockdown defender. I mean, there's no Nate Wiggins on this team corner from Clemson. Nobody liked that. And you got safeties that you think you you can take advantage of uh, as well. And this is a game where Jaheim Bell against those backers or those safeties is going to be a weapon. Kyle Morlock against those backers, those safeties could have a pretty good day for himself. And again, as long as you're not throwing it to the other team, you got a chance to make some big plays against that secondary, whether through the run, whether through the air or on the ground. And again, it's a little bit unpredictable to know what you're getting in in uh in the backup quarterback situation here, but I think this defense, I think that I think Tate Rodemaker, what he brings to the table, what Florida State's going to do offensively, happens to work, it happens to match up well with what Florida do, with what Florida does defensively and what Florida presents. I think they're going to run. I think Florida State will run for over 200 yards, and I think they'll control this game on the offensive side. I think this is going to be a double digit win. Uh, I, I think Florida is is certainly a team that can beat you in this situation, but I think they need a couple turnovers. I think they're going to need, you know, the kind of multiple breakaway plays from their uh, backs kind of game. And I think ultimately they'll hang with Florida State for a while, but I think this is a double digit win. I'm going to go with Florida State winning 34 to 20 in this game. And I think they'll move on, get their opportunity to to play for a a playoff appearance in the ACC title game after dispatching their rival on their home field with the combination of suffocating defense, just limiting, aside from a couple big plays, limiting what Florida is able to do, and then doing well enough through the air with a couple big plays to to some of the freaks, and then basically controlling the game with uh, with some big plays in the running game. That's what I see. I'm less confident about this than I've been about a lot of the games this year where, you know, with Jordan Travis, you knew exactly what you were going to get. A little bit less of that here. But I, I again, I think this is a this is a Florida State offense that matches up really well with what this Florida defense wants to do. They love to bring a lot of players. They, they bring a lot of, uh, they blitz a bunch. And... You know, I think that just simplifies things for Tate Rodemaker as often as not. It just means you're going to get the one-on-ones that you want. It means that you've got a chance. Okay, now Keon Coleman's one-on-one or Johnny Wilson's one-on-one or Jaheim Bell's one-on-one, and I'm just going to go there. And I think that simplifies and speed th- speeds things up for him. And, you know, some of those blitzes, some of those guys get out of their gap, and all of a sudden you've got Benson one-on-one with a safety, with a head of steam. I think there's going to be a number of big plays in this game. Florida State will ultimately run away with it. And like I said, 34-20, Florida State, go with about a 70% chance of winning this game. Uh, would be higher than that with Jordan Travis, obviously, but uh, you know, just too many unknowns in terms of ball security and other things with the, with the less experienced signal caller. So we'll wrap there. Talk to you all after the game on Saturday. If you've been enjoying this podcast, please leave a five-star rating over at Apple Podcasts and wherever else you listen to podcasts, post and repost episodes on social media, 
and tell a friend. And if you haven't left a review in a while, do it again. It really does help the visibility of the podcast. Before we go, I'd also like to thank my advertising partners once more. That's EPR Creations, Louis Marquez of Keller Williams Realty in Jacksonville, Florida, Shenandoah Real Estate in the Research Triangle of North Carolina, Garage Makeovers, the number one garage remodeling company in South Florida, and Justin Galloway of Benchmark Mortgage, serving Florida, Alabama, Tennessee, and Kentucky. You can also stop by the Unconquered shop at unconqueredpodcast.com where you can buy stickers, pins, magnets, t-shirts, and other swag. And thanks also to all those supporters over at Patreon where I post video analysis and field questions for the podcast. I am especially grateful to those above the dynasty level. That is Andrew Garrett, Brian Leininger, Neil Cook, Casey Kidd, Chris Chartrand, Dave Blair, Hector Cartagena, Jack Horton, Jimmy Van, Jonathan Kennedy, Keith Cheney, Lee Caswell, Tyler Kashishke, Vince Calandra, and Bert Bertoldi. You all are far more generous than I deserve. I'm really grateful. Thanks to you all. This has been Unconquered with Doc Staples. I'm your host, Jason Staples. Thanks for listening and thanks for your support. I made this.